what is supposed to happen tonight? And, and maybe this is a refresher course for many of you. Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned that Phil Smith's been coming here for 59 years, so that's a lot of communions. But others, it might be your first time really paying attention. So, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 34. And if you're a Bible marker, this is one of the key passages in the whole Bible about communion. Because if you notice what it says, in verse 23, it says, Paul is talking under the inspiration of God's Spirit, and he reveals something to us. And this is what? Paul wasn't at the Last Supper. Paul wasn't personally one of the disciples. He said that he was born out of due time. He was one that the Lord called after the fact. Now, the, the question that's out is, what's the twelfth gate uh, going to have in, in heaven? You know, when, when the, the, the in, in fact, what's very interesting is that the foundation stones and gates are eternally set, and the apostles' names, which names are on there? It's not going to be Judas, we know that. Is it going to be Matthias or Paul? And that's been a great uh, source of discussion over the years. But Paul, who wasn't one of the disciples yet, is one of the most crucial to the church. Look what he says in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So Jesus personally tutored, tutored him in what communion was supposed to be like. And so that's what I call biblical communion at the Lord's Supper. This is what is supposed to happen. Paul tells us all the rest are accounts of the event. Paul is the application. The rest are historic records, what it says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is the instruction. It's the pattern. It's the template for the church. So Paul received it from the Lord, and I delivered to you. The, and then he starts into explaining it. So the first thing he says is that we are supposed to, and tonight, this is a time that all of us, first of all, and, and if, again, if you want to circle and notice these words, this remembrance of me that's in verse 24 is the backward look. And every time we come to communion, there are three directions that we're supposed to look. And, and I'll trace these with you. Paul makes it very clear. The first one is we're supposed to look back at the cross. And what he says there is, I received from the Lord, this I delivered to you, and the Lord on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And so this, this so far is, is tracking with the Passover celebration, but Jesus, as we talked about at the Seder, is, is transforming into the Lord's Supper. And when he'd given thanks, and uh, this is where uh, that word is where the Catholics get Eucharist. This is the word eucharisteo, you good, karisteo, praise or blessing. So the, the giving of the good uh, thanksgiving time. So Jesus offered thanks and then he broke the bread and he said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And there's a little element here of Jesus associating with all of the sacrifices, saying, I'm the fulfillment of them. And also, he is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. It's all kind of put together by Christ. But this is what he said, do this, and here's the backward look. Every time we come to the table, we need to look back and remember that he suffered, bled, died, that he became sin for us, that that God treated him like he committed the sins we each have committed and sinned in God's sight. And that's the backward look. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. Now, this is what's interesting. Paul is given to the church this night did you know that the new covenant, which is explained in the book of Jeremiah, God made the new covenant with Israel? But we are invited by Christ to become partakers. See, that's why the, and we've talked about it in the past, mistakenly the church said, well, God got rid of the Jews and he took us. Paul said, no. No, we're grafted in, but the, the root, the stump, is Israel. We're just grafted into them. 
And so we have been invited to be partakers of the new covenant. You say, what's the new covenant? Well, just for those of you that take notes, it's Ezekiel chapter 36, and, and two of the most amazing verses are 26 and 27. And the new covenant says he gave us a new heart. That's the heart we talked about this morning, the heart that loves truth, truth lovers. If you haven't gotten a new heart, you haven't been saved. If you don't love truth, you didn't get a new heart, and you're not saved. A new heart and a new spirit. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 5 and 6, that, that we are ministers of the new covenant. It's not the letter. We just don't know the facts, man, just the facts, like Sergeant Friday used to in Dragnet. We have the spirit that empowers the letters brings life to them. It brings them powerfully to light. That's all what the new covenant is. And it's through his blood. The blood of Jesus Christ has ratified, has, has caused the new covenant to take effect. Him shedding. That's why Jesus couldn't be asphyxiated on the cross. He couldn't have been, you know, guillotined. He had to die in a way where he poured out his blood. He had to die through shedding his blood. And so that's what ratifies the new covenant. And this do as often as you drink it. Again, looking back, remembering him. And so one element of communion that we always need to pause for is that looking back. And it doesn't have to be a guided tour. Each of us in different ways look back. Like Ken was leading in that song, we think of my sin, oh, the bliss of that glorious thought. My sin, not just one or two here and there. That's Roman Catholicism. Not, not in part, but the whole. See, the Catholic Church wants to, to forgive sins piecemeal, bit by bit, and make you dependent on the church. Jesus said, no. By one sacrifice forever, I have, I have justified you completely by my sacrifice once and for all. So my sins not in part, but the whole, were nailed to the cross. So his body, 2 Corinthians 5 says, became sin for us, and his blood, as it says in Ephesians 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us, and also 1 John 1, 7, from all sin. And so that's what we look back on and we think about that, that Jesus became sin and he hung on the cross and that, that God treated him like every sin that you've ever committed and I've ever committed, God treated him like he committed those sins. And we, we pause and we look back at that and we remember that. You know, every time I drive down stadium, I see everywhere a car accident has been that the family's still maintaining. Do you see those all over the place? The little cross and the wreath and the flowers and the... You know, they're all over the place. It's not just on stadium. They're along highways. They're everywhere. I mean, there's one in Tulsa. I did the funeral for the little fella that died in the terrible car accident. And, and people like to remember that event. And they go there, and that's why we have cemeteries. We like to remember their life. We like to, to kind of, you know, just remember how they touched our lives. Did you know that's what we're doing here? We're looking back. And remembering that, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And that, that he paid a great price. In fact, like Mary, who, who was such a great sinner that she was weeping at, at Christ's feet. And Jesus said, to whom much is forgiven, what? The same love much? You know, sometimes our love kind of diminishes because we don't look back and think, how much have we been forgiven? So, 1 Corinthians 11 Verses 23 down through 24, this, this section and, and even into verse 25 is all about looking back. Now next, the next thing we see is looking up. Look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. Now there are two elements to this verse. This one is, is the, the, the Greek word keruso. It's actually preaching. It's actually the time where everyone in the church, men, women, children, everybody that's saved gets to preach. We preach through the actual partaking in communion. That's why it's a very serious thing to let it pass by. By the way, 
you should let communion pass by if your hands are dirty. I don't mean you haven't used Purell. I'm talking about if you haven't confessed and forsaken. If there is lingering, smoldering bitterness and unforgiving spirit, if there's hidden sin, the Lord says, I'm going to, I'm going to judge you if you partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Why? Because it's a proclamation. It's a declaring. Actually, this word, this is not the normal word for preaching uh, to proclaim the gospel. It's to declare as a herald. They used to not have the internet. They used to have heralds. A herald was a person sent from headquarters of whatever was the governing office, and the herald would come to the town square and would declare on behalf of the leader a message. It didn't mean they were the leader. It didn't mean that they were anybody. They were only a herald, and they were declaring the message of the important person. Communion is when we declare the importance of Christ as his herald, and we say, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin's not in part, but the whole have been nailed to the cross. And God remembers them no more, and I'm a new creation in Christ. We proclaim that just by taking the bread and the cup, just by being here. That's why, that's why when the book of Hebrews talks about the gathering of the church, the early church used to celebrate communion almost every time they gathered. They're kind of like the Brethren Church, if you've ever heard of the Brethren Church. They always have communion. They celebrate it every Lord's Day. Why? Because they want to proclaim the Lord's death. But look at, look at this second aspect. We go from looking back at the cross to looking up at what the cross accomplished. Remember I told you this morning that the Apostle Paul, his earliest messages where we see what he taught about. He's talking about the future. He's talking about the tribulation. He's talking about the Antichrist. He's talking about looking up until he comes. We are proclaiming the Lord's death till he comes. There's an element of communion that is in force until we see him face to face. Now look what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You know, Wednesday night we had a biblical counseling and discipleship class, and I think I knocked a few people right out of their chairs. There was an audible gasp on Wednesday night. I said, when you come to church, it's not for you to go kibbutzing with your buddies and stand in your little clump of your little clique or group or subset that you always feel comfortable with. This is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to consider. We look over the crowd and examine the crowd, kind of like someone that's going to an auction. You're looking for the stuff that you want to bid on, and you really are looking it all over and trying to figure out what you're going to aim for. And what, what are we aiming for? In order to stir up the people around us to love and to good works. We're, we're going to cheer them on. We're going to... Uh, and express the love of Christ to them. We're, we're going to try and find a way to stir them up spiritually, to say, I've been praying for you. What has happened since the last time I saw you? Has this happened? Has that happened? We stir them up. And the reason we don't forsake our assembling together is because we're supposed to be exhorting each other and seeing the day of Christ's return. We're supposed to be reminding each other every time the church gathers. We look at people and say, are you living like you're expecting the Lord to come at any moment? Are you living like you're doing what he called you to do? Are you living for what he left you here to do? Are you a good servant that when he comes, he's going to find you doing what he, he left you on earth to do? That's what we're all supposed to be doing to each other. Did you know the gathering of the church should sound kind of like the prayer time did? It should just be this hum, this hum of intentional considering. And do you know this considering starts in the car on the way over? It starts saying, oh, I hope I see so-and-so. I hope I see so-and-so. I wonder if someone's going to be there. And, and, I, and Lord, I mean, even in the car praying, Lord, I want to stir them up, and I don't know how to do it. I don't know what their needs are. It's going to be you. Remember, any, any ministry, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6 says, the sufficiency is from God. If anybody's life is changed by the Word of God, 
It's, this pen can't do anything. It just sits there until it's taken and it's held and it doesn't resist and it's allowed to be used. You and I are like this. Do you think this pen thinks, wow, look at that, I can write in Greek? No, it just stays in its little tray until it's used. The fullness of the Spirit, we're like a glove, and the Spirit of God is like the hand that goes in. And when that hand touches lives, the glove isn't what did it, it's the hand, it's the Spirit. He's holding us. He's using us. We're tools in his hand. And so we consider and say, Lord, I want you to fill me. I want you to show me how to. And a lot of people say, well, I can't do it. It's kind of like I told them in the counseling class. You know, it isn't how many degrees you have. It isn't whether you can show off all of your education. It's how connected you are to the hand. The sufficiency is the one holding us, not us. And so we surrender to stir up one another to love and good works. But all of it is talking about what we would call prophecy or eschatology. Do you see how the early church was built around expectancy of Christ's return? You know, Dave Hunt, who's now in the presence of the Lord, that dear saint uh, and, and Bible writer and apologist, died about a month ago. Do you know he wrote a great book in the 90s? It was called Whatever Happened to Heaven? And he says, the more that Western society has gotten into affluence, the less we hear about heaven. In fact, that was on uh, the front page of one of the major news services. You know, they always have these provocative titles. One of them said, how come people don't talk about heaven anymore? It's because it's so much fun on earth right now. I mean, the stock market's at, what, 15,000, 16,000? We're rich again. And, and who wants to think about that? We're supposed to be reminding each other that our lives are not connected to the stock market or the Powerball or anything else. We, we're supposed to be at communion proclaiming that he saved me and loving him for forgiving us so much till he comes. And every other service, we're supposed to be talking about that day approaching. And we're supposed to all, if we're, if we're an effective Spirit prompted, in tune, in step with the Spirit, this is what the Holy Spirit does when he comes to church inside of you. And if you're not doing this, you're resisting him. You understand that? This is what he does when he comes to church. He comes to stir up people to love and good works through us. And if we're not doing that, we need to look up. And communion is when we pause and we look back and say, thanks for saving me. And then we look up and say, remind me what you saved me for. Remind me that I'm headed, this world isn't my home, I'm headed to be with you forever. And I'm your servant, and I don't know when you're coming, but when you come, I want you finding me, doing what you left me to do. So, number one, we look back. Number two, we look up. But then, it doesn't stop there. If we can get to the next page. Oh, it doesn't like me tonight, but I'm not going to talk to it. There we go. Look at this. This is the third one. Look back, look up. Now we're supposed to look inside. And this is very important. Starting in verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord, now look at how he keeps talking about this, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now who's speaking? The Apostle Paul. Who told him to say that? The Lord. Who's he talking to? believers in a local church just like ours we're we're a perpetuation of what paul was doing we're, we're doing the same thing we're we're gathering in christ's name we're we got the same book we have the same spirit the same lord and different culture but the bible is super cultural and it transcends every culture and it brings us to the same place and what he said to the church is, if you partake in communion in an unworthy manner, you're guilty of something. So how do we keep from this guilt? Because that's negative, it's bad. We examine ourselves. This is the look within. You notice the order, though. We don't do this introspection until we've looked back and remembered we're completely, once and for all, forgiven. And we're here for a purpose. 
but how am I doing? And we look within and we examine ourselves. Then we can eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, and there it is again, in this unworthy manner, eats and drinks. Now there's a negative word. Crino, judgment to himself. Why? Not discerning what the Lord did. In his body, he became sin for us so that sin might no longer have dominion over us. And if we examine ourselves and say that we have secret sins that we're hiding, we have, we have people on earth that have only sinned against us this much, and we're not going to forgive them even though the God of heaven, we've sinned that much, and he's completely forgiven us, but we're holding out for people on earth. That's Matthew 18. You remember the unforgiving servant? Not discerning what the Lord did. For this reason, and verse 30, you've heard me talk about many times, Paul's talking to a local church, and they understood what he meant. How big was the church in Corinth, by the way? Was it the size of, you know, uh, the, the big church in Chicago, Heibel's church? Was it the size of Calvary? Mm -mm. There's not a house in Corinth, and they've excavated almost the whole city. There's not a house in Corinth that could hold more than 100 people. Not one. Paul spent 18 months with a congregation of 100 or less. Paul. Isn't that amazing to think about? That the big gun of all guns would work with 100 people? See, God isn't into numbers like we are. It doesn't matter if you have 30,000 in your church. What matters is if it's a pleasing God and how many people are maturing spiritually. But in that little church of 100 or less, Many were weak and sick among you. And all of a sudden, people started going, yeah, the one that's filing a lawsuit against this person, the one that gets drunk at communion, the one who's committing adultery, you know, and they started in their minds saying, whoa, yes, the chastening hand. And many sleep. And I'm not talking about the morning service here. <laughs> This was dead. Our brother Lazarus sleeps. Dead. The ultimate chastening. When a Christian won't live like a Christian, God says, your time's up. We call it premature death. God calls it chastisement. Takes them home. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So what is that judgment? It's self-examination. It's looking within. It's making sure that, that there is no unconfessed, unforsaken sin. So, come on. Doesn't like me tonight. So, what Paul said we're supposed to do when we're gathered together is to make sure we purge out the old leaven that we may be a new lump since we're truly unleavened. For Paul says... We are supposed to judge those who are inside the church. Part of that inward look is to make sure that we never allow within the local church anyone who claims to be a Christian who directly disobeys the Lord. 